The word problematic doesn't mean what so many of y'all think it means. So don't panic. We are going to be throwing the word problematic around a lot in this video. I promise it's going to be okay. No one is going to break down your door with pitchforks. Nobody is going to be burning any human beings. Okay. I swear, some of y'all hear the word problematic and think radioactive. All it means is that there are some issues within the text or the source material. And issues, as we know, can mean any number of things. An issue can be something structurally. It can be something incredibly small that needs to be creaked or creaked. Not Craig. Up the creek. Craig up the creek. Sorry, my eyeball was itching. Also, I hate the word eyeball. I don't wanna have balls in my eyes. I don't even wanna have balls in my mouth. So that's what we're going to be doing in this video. We're going to be talking about some books by authors of color that are problematic. There were a few people in the first video that I did talking about problematic black authors. Actually, I think there was just one person and they killed me. I love this person. I wanna be friends with them so bad. They killed me. Because whatever planet they're living on, I'm trying to go. That shit was wild. I don't believe in tearing down my own people. Love for me is about nuance and balance. It's like you're there through the good and the bad, the thick and the thin. When you love any community, you love your black community, you love queer community, whatever, you have to be willing to critique that community or else whatever issues y'all have are never gonna get fixed. So the idea that, be, that you can only love black folk by treating all black people like they're innocent angels all the, all the time, every, every time, and that every movie, TV show, book, manuscript, any kind of art that a black person puts out is incapable of being harmful in any way, shape, or form. That's wild to me because it means that you don't really love black people. You love this idealized version of what a black person is and it flattens us as a community. I wanna be a whole person and in order for anybody to love me, they have to also acknowledge that I'm not perfect and I'm gonna make mistakes. So treating all black people and their work like they are perfect and inherently incapable of doing wrong is weird to me. And to me, it means you don't actually love your own people, but that's none of my business. That's none of my business. I wanna start off with some positivity and some excitement and give a really big shout out to the sponsor of today's video. Introducing Peta Studio, founded by Peter Chizoba Daniel. I'm so excited to be partnering with this incredible studio for the release of Chayoma, Curse of the Junkura Volume 2. If y'all were here when we were absolutely dying over the release of Volume 1, you will know how long we've been anticipating Chayoma Round 2. She is back with another installment, the second volume which will be 200 pages of action-packed African epic fantasy with beautiful, great artwork. Born to a clan of witchcraft, her noble nature calls for redemption. Chayoma becomes aware of her destiny foretold by the Mlezi, and it calls for her greatest task. She hails from the Katara kingdoms of East Africa, bearing with her the curse of the Jangura. This studio consistently centers powerful African women in their storytelling. Everything from the costumes and the world building, the cultural depictions really, really spoke to me. Honestly, if you were looking for an amazing publisher with unmatched illustrations and storytelling that are centering folk of the African diaspora, then look no further. Chayoma Curse of the Jangura is also the story of the Basoro and the Jangura, remnants of the Bachwezi dynasty, also known as demigods, and they seek to restore their glory after the Great War and return to the Celestial Plane, a world of myth, magic, fantasy, folklore, and ruthless politics. And backing this project opens up pathways for you to witness new styles of storytelling, centering diversity in content and storytelling. The Kickstarter link is located in the description box down below, as well as the website, so that you can check out all of the other incredible stories they have to offer. Let's talk about Portrait of a Thief by Grace D. Lee. This was one of my most anticipated books of last year. It was one of the most anticipated books of last year. Everybody was so geeked about it, and then it came out, and people were like, figure out why I was like why are people not loving this book thriving about this book posting it everywhere there was so much hype about it and then I read 
the reviews and I think that a lot of people just wanted to be kind and it was one of those things where it's like if you don't have something nice to say don't say something at all I never learned that lesson that's why I'm here on my YouTube channel hi my name is Jesse the main issues that people had were primarily logistic issues and with the wild suspending of disbelief Ocean's Eleven meets the farewell in a portrait of a thief, a lush lyrical heist novel. Inspired by the true story of Chinese art vanishing from Western museums about diaspora, the colonization of art, and the complexity, complex, complexity of the Chinese American identity. So obviously this book sounds, so obviously, Natasha. As y'all can understand from the synopsis, the book sounds absolutely incredible. And the book came out and everybody was like, oh, except the problem was it wasn't good though. One of the reviews talks about how they were planning a heist on Zoom in a Google Doc. So we loved that. Our homie Tammy has an amazing video covering her issues with this book. So I'm going to leave that link down below because she is incredible. And if you're not subscribed to her channel, like what the fuck are you doing? We're just going to quickly read this bit from Tammy's Goodreads review, which is going to be linked down below. More egregiously, in my opinion, is the flattening of the different communities within the Chinese American diaspora, but specifically the flattening of diaspora families that originate from Hong Kong versus China. There's more about that in the video, in the review excuse me so that is a sentiment that I have heard reflected many many times over by other Chinese reviewers and there's also this review by another Chinese reviewer that says I am also conflicted on some of the underlying messages conveyed in portrait of a thief where money is equated to ultimate happiness and in particular the idolized view of China it has never made convincingly, it was never, oh my god, it is never made convincingly clear why these five Asian American college students have such a blind devotion to any country they are not fully familiar with. It's ambiguity between accomplishing the mission at hand, returning art to its righteous owner, and equating it to general patriotism leaves me a little uncomfortable. Next up, we have a book that disappointed me more than my father when he walked out on the family. It breaks my already broken heart to be adding you're not supposed to die tonight to this list. I had so many of y'all be like, I cannot believe that y'all are trying another one of Baron's books. Because everybody knows how much we did not like her first book, Cinderella is dead or isn't dead. We can never tell. It's like Schrodinger's Cinderella. Is she in the box dead or is she alive in the box? We don't fucking know. The point is the book has Cinderella and she's in a dress. We hated that book. We had so many issues with it. We're pretty sure we talked about this in our Problematic Black Authors video. So if you're interested in why we didn't like Cinderella is dead, check out that video. I thought that Cinderella was a problematic book and I still was excited to check out more books from that author as she grew as a writer and worked on her craft. So I picked up this book. We are following a girl who acts as a final girl at this summer camp where they put on slasher shows and then the show gets a little too real. It starts off hard right away. There's an opening scene and it's a killing scene. Then I got to page five. I couldn't get five pages. I couldn't get five pages into this book without some nonsense. I was so upset. It perpetuated one of my biggest pet peeves. It absolutely disgusts me. I see it in movies, I see it in TV shows, I see it in books. It is something that happens repeatedly and it is so casually violent and disgusting and completely unacceptable that it triggers and gets me to level 10 angry every single time. Normally when I find something that's problematic in a book, I don't have an actual physical response. I'm not like genuinely angry. There's just the intellectual analytical part of my brain that's like, this is the product of something that's harmful in our, so in our society that we need to be working on so that it doesn't get perpetuated in the future kind of thing. This shit though made me so mad. I was like, are you kidding me? You're really going to perpetuate this in 2023? The other Camp Mirror Lake staff crowd around us and the other guests who'd been eliminated earlier in the night reappear. Tasha resurrects herself and scrambles to her feet, the knife rig still attached to her body. I wipe my mouth with the back of my hand and the sickly sweet corn syrup sticks to my lips. Someone cues the music. The Halloween theme song blasts through the camp. Leslie, the chick who got snatched up by the Mason Lodge, pushes her way through the crowd, marches up to Brandon, and slaps him so hard that spit flies out of his mouth. The entire crowd goes silent. You left me, she screams. You ran away. I am so sick of 
women slapping their male partners, punching their male partners, shoving their male partners when they do something that they don't like is normalized in our society. There is a whole scene in Sex in the City when, with Carrie and Big asleep in bed and Big in his sleep like nudges Carrie or just isn't giving her enough room or takes the blanket, something like that, something that you do when you're sleeping, you're cold or whatever, you're, take, you're used to taking up space. And she gets frustrated and punches him in the face because she is mad. And he even wakes up and is like, why would you hit me? Why would you punch me? And she's like, because you pissed me off, essentially. And there's just this really weird phenomenon that keeps happening where it is seen as cute or quirky or used for comedic relief for a woman to slap the shit out of her male partner because he made her unhappy. That's abuse. That is domestic violence. Not a plot device. It's not a cue. It's not comedic relief. It disgusts me each and every single time that I see it. What the fuck? I get so angry about this. It's unacceptable. That is not the same thing as your partner has threatened you, you're unsafe, you're defending yourself. Fucking fight for your goddamn life. I'm never gonna tell somebody not to. This is even perpetuated in one of my favorite movies of all time, The Holiday with Cameron Diaz, Kate Winslet, Jack, Jack Black, and Jude Law. It came out in 2007. And right in the beginning of the movie, Cameron Diaz's character, she gets cheated on, which is an unacceptable thing. And she responds by punching her boyfriend as hard as she can in the, in the face. And it is seen as a comedic event. It disgusts me. I, I do not ever want to see people punching, kicking, slapping their partner used as a comedic device. I don't understand why I have to talk about the fact that this is disgusting in, in, in this era. I'm just, I'm confused by it. I read that and then I read it again and then I kept reading to see like, okay, on the next page do we talk about how unacceptable that is? On the next page are people going up and comforting this man who was just attacked by his partner in public, humiliated in public, abused in public. We're not going to talk about that. It's a boy, so it's fine. It's acceptable it's I just don't get it next page the narrator says I'm so proud of us I feel bad for Brandon and his now ex-girlfriend but they knew what they signed up for don't feel bad that the relationship ended feel bad for the fact that Brandon got physically assaulted by his now ex-girlfriend feel bad for that it just disgusted me. That is all I'm going to say about that book. I actually am still in the middle of reading that book and I'm very much enjoying it. And that is a really good example of what I mean by sometimes there are just these lines, these things in books where you're like, wow, that really is not okay. Does that mean throw the whole author away? Does that mean throw the whole book away? Does that mean that I'm going to hold a grudge against this woman for the rest of my life? Absolutely not. But it does mean that I'm going to speak out about it and say that as a reader, as a domestic abuse survivor, as somebody who cares about domestic abuse regardless of the gender or background of the person, which is how it's supposed to be, that absolutely disgusted me. And every single time I see that perpetuated in any form of media, I'm gonna go off. Oh, it just makes me so mad. Next up, we're gonna talk about Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zevin. I am very, very excited to be unpacking some of my issues within this book. This, of course, is just one of the most beloved books that have come out in the last two years. It came out two years ago, a bunch of people read it, and then it was like it was re-released the next year and everybody lost it. My dog was reading this goddamn book, you know what I'm saying? There's some great things about it, I'm not gonna lie, but there's also some very important issues with this book, primarily about how Sam's character is treated throughout the text and Sam's character has been heavily critiqued. A lot of disabled reviewers did not vibe with the disability representation and depiction in Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. And this is because of the way Sam, who is a mixed race kid, living with his disability, a physical disability, is treated throughout the novel. He is seen as an object for pity. He is falling into that narrative of the tragic disabled person, meaning every second of a disabled person's life, especially those with physical disabilities, is agony, perpetuating the idea that 
disabled folks with physical disabilities hate their bodies and are miserable and are ashamed of their bodies. And that was just so heavy. That was such a big point, a big factor of Sam's character. A lot of disabled folks really did not feel good about that. And as somebody who lives with invisible disabilities, I definitely had strong feelings about it as well. I have mixed feelings about this book and the disability representation and depiction, which is why eventually I'm going to make a dedicated video. Let me know if that's something that you want me to prioritize though, or if it's something that you're cool waiting for. So feel free to let me know if you'd rather see a video on that sooner rather than later. But another reason why a lot of people are uncomfortable, people of color specifically, with this book is because of the way that it doesn't lead the reader in terms of a solution to racially sensitive issues. For example, both Sadie and Sam create this character named Ichigo. The character is, we believe, Japanese by origin, but gender-wise is ambiguous. And there's a lot of conversations about cultural appropriation because Sam is not Japanese and Sadie is not Japanese. There are a lot of really racially loaded conversations that aren't written about in a way where you can see where the author stands. Instead, the author is kind of just presenting how these characters feel about race. A lot of readers really like that because they appreciate when an author isn't leading them to a conclusion. So I tried reading On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous and that book was not for me. I was like, no, it's not the vibe. It's not the vibe. Love seeing this queer Asian male poet be worshiped the way that he is in our literary community. We fucking love to see that. I loved it. Writing just wasn't for me, absolutely not. And Ocean released a book titled Time as a Mother because of the fact that we so vehemently disliked and had to DNF on Earth for Briefly Gorgeous, we were like, mm, we're gonna leave Time as a Mother alone and save that book for the people who are super geeked to read it. And I want to share a review from one of my most darling friends, his name is Paris, he is like, the book reviewer for me. Paris's book reviews are unmatched, period. And he really did not like this book. Early November of last year, Paris writes, something else that must be said, as a black queer American, I took umbrage with Ovi's flamboyant, mad libsy use of AAVE, twerked, lit, motherfucker, to spice up these dry, unseasoned, hipster poems. This is the mark of an amateur, one who can't resist appealing to the whims of yuppie white kids whom this language was obviously meant to amuse. Non-black writers who commodify black slang in their art like this, no matter how sparingly, do so in a sad, desperate attempt to earn a seat with the cool kids and that desperation was embarrassingly apparent. I can't stand him. He edits this to say, I've been informed the AVE I criticized of the E galley never made it to print. I wouldn't know I didn't buy the book. If so, kudos to the editor. This is not the first time I have heard this criticism to, especially from black folks, cause like honestly, if you are not black, your opinion on the appropriation of AAVE does not matter to me personally. It's just never gonna matter. It's just like how if you're not black, your opinion of the N word is never gonna matter to me. I don't care what your argument is. I don't care how mad you are that I don't care. The fact of the matter is I don't care. So there's nothing that you can say that's gonna make me care. Black folk, how do you feel about non-black writers of color using AAVE in their works? Would love to know. Obviously, if you are not black and you have an opinion on this, share it below. I'm not gonna care, but share it because <laughs> somebody else will care. But just know there's like no level of mad you can be that's gonna make me care. Let's talk about The Five Midnights by Anne Davila Cardinal. I was so excited about this book and I hated it. This book details the experience of five friends who are cursed and trying to come to retribution with that curse, trying to figure out like, how can I not be cursed? How can I not get eaten by this thing that's hunting? It's set in Puerto Rico and we are following a girl whose name I believe is Lupe. She is either half Puerto Ricanya or she is 
Puerto Ricania and raised in the United States. We can't remember because we don't care. And when she moves to Puerto Rico for the summer, her neighborhood begins to get plagued by these murders of teenagers. And her caretaker, I believe it is her uncle, her tío, is like, don't get involved. And she decides to conduct a whole fucking mystery investigation on these murders. Now, first of all, we have to suspend our disbelief that this child is out here waltzing through the crime scene. I was driving in a part of town that white people are traditionally scared of. <laughs> We're at a stoplight and I see two men. One man was running. Behind him, there's another man. He's running. Man number two is carrying a semi-automatic rifle. I just was like, I love this for you. And I had no questions. I didn't care what was going on. It, it had nothing to do with me. I was like, when does the light turn green? I'm thinking about my nachos that I've got waiting for me at home. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm the least troubled person ever. All of that to say, a crime could fall in my lap and I would have no desire to solve it because it's none of my business. And I was taught the way that my blackness and my Mexicanness is set up. I was taught not to ask questions. So I just didn't connect with the main character for that reason, but I loved that for her. Now this book got heavily criticized by myself because of the way that drug users were treated in the book. Drug use and substance use is a big portion of this book, specifically young, people of color who are addicts and struggling with addiction. The demonization of addicts was disgusting. It is a disease, it is an illness. And the way that it was written about was like, y'all are weak, y'all just aren't trying enough. You're lazy, this is a character flaw. You don't really deserve resources, etc. I just, I was really grossed out by that, especially as somebody who was studying to be a substance use counselor. And I was like five credits from finishing that, but I ended up going a different path. Anyway, Puerto Ricano reviewers spoke a lot about the demonization of Puerto Rico, the way that it was depicted, and the elitism that was in this book about class, the colorism, that sort of thing. So all, all in all, this was really disappointing because it was supposed to be like a Stranger Things vibe situation, Stranger Things, but make it Latine. And I was so geeked about that, but unfortunately it just didn't work. Then we got to talk about Kevin Kwan's Crazy Rich Asians. When I joined the booktube community, I read this book. And at the time, did I notice the lavishly offensive use of AAVE? the appropriation of black culture, the wearing black people like a second skin, wearing black people and culture as literal costumes. It just straight up felt like blackface to me. Did I notice it? Of course. I had so much fun with the book. I'm pretty sure the n-word even showed up and y'all know how I feel about that. This book is unacceptable. This is the kind of problematic book where I'm like, yeah, never, never gonna buy a book from you like kind of situation again. This is the same thing that has been critiqued in the movies. But what's ironic about it is that Aquafina, who is an actress that I have a very mixed relationship with because she is, whether you want to admit it or not, problematic as fuck. She has literally made her entire career off of black culture, black fashion, black speak, and not been very receptive when this has been brought up. And that is what it is, but I love other things about her and so I have decided that as a black person I'm allowed to have my complex ass feelings about her and I still watch her movies. What I find ironic about this is that Aquafina plays one of the most lavishly anti-black characters within the book and I just find that funny as fuck and I think that's the character who, who ends up saying the n-word. And by anti-black I don't mean hating black people, but to me appropriation and treating us like you can just wear us like a shadow when it suits you is a form of anti-blackness. But did I not love this book? Oh my God, I loved seeing Asian people be loud and lavish and geek out about their fashion, their culture, their food. I loved the nuance of th these books. I loved the issues within the diaspora that were brought up. I loved the conversations about class. I learned so much. There's so much about this book to value and adore. I thought it was funny, it was entertaining, all of it. And so this is a series that I'm actually going to be continuing with in, in private. Or there's a video that I really want to do, I've been wanting to do for a while, where I read books by problematic authors and dissect them. But long story short, this is a book that is going on my list of books that I love that I would never ever recommend. And if you want to see more in that series that series is linked down below as well. Long story short, Kevin Kwan is very problematic. And finally, we're going to talk about everyone's problematic fave, 
and that is Hanya Yankara. I I wrote a little wife and my goodness. We're not even going to get started there. We're just not, we're just not even gonna go there. What I will be talking about in this video is To Paradise, because I've already critiqued and talked about A Little Life in another video in the Problematic Books That I Love series, so I'm not gonna do that here. Instead, I'm gonna pick on To Paradise. I'm going to defer to the absolute literary genius that is Olivia of Stories for Coffee. Olivia is the most underrated reviewer, nerd, aesthetically driven influencer in the world. We just do not understand why Olivia does not have 10 million worshippers, honestly. Her reels are incredible. Her aesthetic is unmatched. Her analyses are amazing. Her vibe, her sweetness. I just, oh my God, I love her so much and I'm just waiting for the rest of the world to get their shit together. There's a review that she did on Goodreads. It's gonna be linked down below. One star, DNF. I truly don't know what Hanya was trying to do with a revisionist version of early America. She went wild with degrading black people, and there were far too many anti-indigenous comments thrown into the first half of the book. I was grasping for a reason as to why she was set setting the first third of her novel in this time period. Was it to excuse the racism she so happily sprinkled into the novel? Was it the true point of this first third of the novel? I tried to understand her mindset, but gave up because the plot was going nowhere and all of these characters were irredeemable in my eyes due to their blatant prejudice. Many will defend this novel and say, well, it's set in 1893 America. This is what happened back then. Racism was still disgusting back then. Thank you. you see how Hamilton used none of that language on stage? Be more like Hamilton. Honestly, Hanya reminds us so much of Donna Tart. And honestly, like this review is everything wrong with Donna Tart. Whenever people are like, what's y'all issue with Donna Tart? And I'm like, besides what I've already shared multiple times, this, people act like you can't show racism in your text or problematic things in your text without using slurs. Never mind, just don't get me started. Donna Tart is a racist, bigoted, no excuses for that woman. Also, she can't write. And every time I try and look at the synopsis for To Paradise, I get bored and fall asleep. So let's try this again. This is so fucking boring. So why is the synopsis so fucking long? The synopsis for this book is longer than my entire relationship with my father was. If you want to figure out what To Paradise is about, just look it up. But besides of the fact that To Paradise is another example of Hanya just putting gay, queer male characters through as much trauma as humanly imaginable. I just draw the line in anti-blackness. I just can't. I draw the line at slurs. Like, I just, I draw the line. Hanya is an author that I will never ever purchase a book from. You will never see me recommending a book from this person. I don't care if Hanya writes the key to the stars. Have fun, because I'm not going if she's there. I do not support this author. So what are some problematic authors of color that you want to see more discourse and more dialogue about what are the issues that you had with their books and in their texts and if they if you've read more books from that author do you think that those issues have been sufficiently critiqued and worked on and addressed again this video is a labor of love i love being brown i love being a mixed race person of color i love my community i love centering bipoc authors and a part of that love is it has to be tough sometimes so I hope that you found this video to be nuanced and entertaining. If you want more content from me, exclusive content for you and only you and our community, we have the Patreon. It is Hannibal the Cannibal themed and it's really, really fun. It's really fun, so definitely join. And if you like these spicy videos where I'm ranting a bit, like this one, there is a playlist of my popular videos down below along with all the videos that I've referenced. Do not forget to check out that Kickstarter. It is down below. It is an amazing publisher. Y'all gotta support. Y'all have to support. I also am really active over on Instagram. Check me out there as well. And if you're trying to join a non-binary book club, I run one on Instagram and it is at NBENBY book club. Until next time, kids.